Hey listeners, welcome back to Unfeigned Christianity, where we discuss issues that threaten the genuineness of our faith. I'm your host, Asher Whitmer, and I'm excited today to have on the podcast Dr. John Waldron from Virginia. He works at a he's a family doctor. And he's been practicing for about 20 years. I think he spent 17 years at a small office in or small hospital in Indiana and is now working in Virginia. And he's over the the course of the summer and the COVID pandemic, he's been putting out weekly updates where he just kind of overviews what he's seeing in the news and then what he's seeing in his practice and then just talking about a few dynamics. Um, in his most recent one, he talked about uh, herd immunity and that concept, and then um, masking. And then he often ends his updates with a little devotional and just kind of a word of hope. So I reached out to him and just thought, hey, it'd be interesting to have, fun to have you on and just share with with my audience kind of where we're at with COVID and then just discuss some of the different dynamics that I'm sure we've all thought about and heard about. Um, one of the things I really appreciate about D- Dr. Waldron is he is not inflammatory. He He's not political. He's not making strong statements. He more just speaks from his observation as a family doctor. And he's he acknowledges his realm of expertise as a family doctor, but then also the the limitations that that gives. And and I think that's crucial in a day and age where we have people who just claim some kind of medical profession and claim authority on this and, and say they know all about it. And then we pass those YouTube videos around and and we can get a lot of misinformation, contradictory information. I hope this conversation is helpful just in gaining perspective. Obviously it's, it's not going to solve all the questions that we have is not going to answer everything, but I think it can help us gain some perspective. So I'm excited to share it with you again, as always, if you appreciate the podcast and you want to support us, you can do so for as little as $5 a month or for as much as whatever you, you jolly well feel like giving. Uh, there's, there's extra content, uh, bonus content experiences that you're able to enjoy depending on how much you give. You can check that out on patreon.com forward slash Asher Whitmer. And then also just want to invite you, if, if you listen to the show and you want to give feedback, positive or negative, go ahead and leave a rating or review. If you're watching the YouTube version of this, go ahead and subscribe. Or, I mean, if you don't like it, you don't have to subscribe. But <laughs> if you do and you want to want to get more videos subscribe give a thumbs up uh, leave a comment leave a review one thing i'm doing is if you especially on itunes if you leave a review then i will read it out loud on the next episode just so that my audience is aware of just kind of the feedback that's coming in so if this has spoken to you been helpful to you or if you've just absolutely found it horrendous go ahead and leave whatever feedback you want that is helpful to me in knowing how I can better serve you. So thank you for that. Also, just to let you know, give recognition, uh, my friend Corey Steiner is the one who, the artist behind the music on this show. I don't mention it near often enough, but if you want to go check his work out, it's Corey Steiner Music, I think, dot wordpress.com. I'll have a link below in the episode, but he is the, the artist behind the music, and he's definitely worth checking out for, for other works that he has done. So thank you, Corey, for that. And without any more rambling, let's get to my conversation with Dr. John Waldron. All right, we are going live. John, thanks for being on Unfeigned Christianity. It's good to be here. So for my audience, for my listeners, this just by way of explanation, this is kind of the year of meeting and interviewing people that I've not necessarily ever met before face to face. And John Waldron is another one. John, I I was trying, we were talking beforehand, I was trying to remember how I first came across John. Um, He's a family doctor practicing in Virginia. You said just south of Lynchburg, Virginia? Just south of Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have practiced for 20 years. You 
spent 17 years in Indiana. Is that correct? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Little town called now, Paoli. Sorry. Oh, it's a little town called Paoli, Indiana. Paoli, Indiana. Okay. Very good. I, I'm not super familiar with Indiana yet. More northern Indiana. Is Paoli up north or is it? Southern? No, it's down south. So it would, we okay. would have attended church at Fresh Start if you've heard of Fresh oh, okay. Start. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, now three years you've been in Virginia mm-hmm. practicing and obviously that's where you were when COVID hit. And mm-hmm. John has done, made a habit. Has it been from the very beginning in March of posting weekly updates? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm not sure why I decided to do it. I just... I guess <laughs> I probably spent too much time on social media, but it was really bothering me. Some of the different things people were saying. And so I decided, yeah. well, I just would try to summarize um, the what facts that seeing. I could see them at that point. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't even remember what friend it was that shared it or who, how I started seeing your updates, but they, the thing that I remember it hitting was it, they were informative. They were uh, talking about the data in in a disarming way, like it wasn't didn't feel inflammatory. And then you you well, you also like very clearly clarify that you're a family doctor as opposed to a virologist or something. Um, other updates or videos that go around, it's it. it people can tend to, Oh, I'm, I'm a medical professional. So Mm -hmm. I know everything about this. Um, that's kind of a generalization, but, but I appreciated just the upfront acknowledging where your realm of expertise is and then where your limitations are. And Mm -hmm. then also you end your updates with just a, a word of hope and just for the body of Christ, kind of how, how to, stay hopeful as we navigate through this. And and that just felt very, felt like a good source of reasonable information during a pandemic that's been very chaotic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you said, all kinds of stuff on social media that that's crazy, but. Yeah, I hope it's been helpful. It certainly takes time to put things together. And a lot of times it's just sort of me, uh, trying to sift through my own thoughts about where things are at. Cause I yeah. don't know, you know, yeah. I, I don't I know. Have, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, uh, zoom just cut out a little bit. I don't know if the recording caught up there, but he said, I don't know if Dr. Fauci knows is that. Mm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we expect perfection of our, of our experts and our leaders. And it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of a, it's a new thing. So we don't know what all is going to come or change or whatever. I have two siblings that are nurses. One just entered a year ago. And and then my older brother has been a nurse for, I don't know, three or four years, maybe five years now. I'm not sure. So it's been interesting hearing them process what they're seeing. He works in in ER. My sister works in, well, has worked on the telly for till recently she moved to ICU. Um, and her floor actually got changed at her hospital, got changed into the COVID unit during the peak of it here in LA, at least earlier on. Um, and it's, it, just hearing them talk, there's so much new information coming out, so many things changing and it's easy like on one hand, it's easy to understand why it looks like people might be trying to deceive others because they're changing. They say one thing one time and then it to the general public, it sounds like it's totally different. But it's mm-hmm. just given me kind of a little window into how complex these things are. And it's not all evil malice behind it. No, it's new in that. Anytime you have something new, people say things, and then sometimes it turns out that the things that we thought were true in the beginning change. And yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's not that people are deliberately lying, but they 
but they say things that um, turn out not to be accurate. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I guess um, just to kind of jump in here, where are we at with COVID? For for our listeners, you can – I'm assuming John's okay with with you guys looking him up and, and tracking the updates. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, um, so I, I guess what I would say is that um, – my data that I look at, typically I look at either um, Johns Hopkins has a has a website um, that you can access. Um, and the thing that I find is useful there is actually looking at the individual states and the percent positive COVID testing. So um, if you see the percent positive going up, then that's concerning because it says, you know, that we're running more tests and more of them are coming back positive. Um, hmm. And so it's trending up right now. You know, people are talking about a, a third wave. So back in March, April in the Northeast, there was a really big initial wave. Um, hmm. And then over the summer, more in the South Georgia, um, Florida, and then actually out in California, I think there were there was a kind of a second wave. And then here, then there's a third wave. Um, where we're starting to see an increase. Um, and they're saying maybe it's because of people being indoors more, cooler um, cooler weather. But every state except for, I think I saw Missouri and Connecticut have trended up the last couple of weeks. So it's a little concerning. Um, yeah. It, it's not as bad as it was earlier, but it's, um, but it's not headed the right direction either, we'd say. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know my, my grandparents live in Illinois. And we've been wanting to see them this year. And then when we were going to see them was kind of right in the middle of what was June, the end of May, June. And so like it was kind of the peak of a lot of different areas. We decided to push it off and tentatively planning for Thanksgiving. And now uh, my grandma emailed this morning. It was saying that Illinois has been, spiking or tr- trending up pretty significantly yeah. mm-hmm. what um so just a question about the case numbers and positive case numbers like i think throughout the uh the states and throughout especially maybe the the christian world there's a lot of suspicion about the validity of these tests and like can we trust the numbers? It seems like there's no um, one standardized test way of testing and so forth. Can you speak to that at all? Like, is can can we trust so, these test numbers? And- I think the test numbers are pretty decent. What I would say is that um, the gold standard test is the PCR test, uh, which is a plumber shape polymerase chain reaction test, which is looking for fragments of the virus. Um, in our uh, noses and our airways. Um, And then the rapid test um, is not as accurate. So I would say if you have a negative or a positive rapid test, I don't trust them as much. Um, They just have a higher rate of false positives and false negatives. Okay, interesting. What is the rapid test? So so there's a test. um, I know Abbott Laboratories has one that comes back in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, whereas the typical PCR test is taking one to two days to run. Oh, okay. Um, so you're so, so normally when you go to an urgent care um, around here anyway, they run the PCR test, and okay. you get a call a day or two later, and they say you know it's positive or it's negative. Yeah. So my wife and I uh, both had COVID. We we each had it, and then our younger son had it, and mm-hmm. we did a like the mouth swab test and it took three took 48 hours to get our <laughs> results would that have been the that would be a pcr test the pcr test okay yeah. yeah and those are pretty accurate i would say there's some false negatives with that but um and then th- there may be some false positives too so there there's a little bit of um, a situation where if you have a little bit of the DNA around that cross reacts, maybe that shows up, mm, yeah. but it's not, you know, yeah. I would say they're pretty accurate tests. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then I guess there's the reality too of like we, there was one family in our church who got, they all got sick and had the symptoms and they were around somebody who tested positive. And so they assumed they had COVID and treated like quarantine, like they have COVID, but never got tested. So there's yeah. probably a lot of like, even if there are false positives, not only do the false negatives counter that out, there's, there's also probably a lot of people just not getting tested that, that might actually have it. Yeah, so, so the CDC has tried to quantify it by doing antibody testing, and they say about 9% of the U.S. population has antibodies to COVID right now. Okay. Um, so to kind of put that in perspective, um, the number of, I think I looked a couple of days ago, and it was a little over 7 million people had tested positive for COVID. Um, but you know, that would, you know, if, if 10% of the U S population had COVID, that'd be in the 30 million, you know, 30 couple million range. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, wow. so it, it's a lot more people probably have had it than what have tested positive. We're tending to test the sicker folks. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, for whatever reason don't want to get tested and they don't. Yeah. What? How does that affect, like, uh, one perspective that I hear a lot is, like, uh, we should, this, there's way more people that have it than what's even counted for, and it's, so it's not as deadly as what they say it is. It's not a serious virus. What What is your response to something like that? Well, I... So I think it is a pretty serious virus. Um, people seem to compare it to influenza, and it's um, you know probably at least three or four times more deadly than influenza. Um, but I think maybe, well, we'll we'll leave that for the moment. <laughs> what I would what I would say though is that um, people get a lot sicker with COVID than what we typically do with flu. Um, I. I just have had a number of my patients who've been admitted to the hospital with COVID. And I just really didn't, don't see that typically with influenza. In a typical influenza season, I will have one or two patients who get admitted to the hospital. I usually do not have any patients who die from it. Um, and I know the CDC runs numbers at the end of the flu season and they say, well, you know, the excess deaths due to pneumonia and respiratory things, and then they calculate which percentage of percentage of them are from influenza. Um, but this is really people getting COVID and ending up in the hospital on high flow oxygen and, mm -hmm. you know, getting treated pretty aggressively because they're really sick, you know, needing yeah. dialysis, getting blood clots that they're, you know, unusual situations. Yeah. And then there's, <laughs> then there's the whole question. I didn't have, I didn't, throw this question at you either ahead of time but um the whole question of like how deaths are counted and and people people think people questioning the validity of the death count and stuff like what are your thoughts on that so you know there's a a lot of people don't understand how a death certificate is filled out um and, and i unfortunately had to fill out a number of them in my time, not, and I never yeah. put down COVID because I'd never had a patient that I was taking care of who died um, from COVID. But typically you don't have just one diagnosis on the, on the death certificate. Um, so let's say somebody had um, heart disease um, and they developed COVID and then, you know, they had a heart arrhythmia and they died. Well, you put down heart arrhythmia and you put down, you know, myocardial infarction, and then you'd put down COVID. So all three of those would appear on the death certificate. And maybe the COVID was the, you know, kind of the domino that fell that, you know, caused these other things to show up. Um, hmm. And, you know, there's also this sort of rumor that doctors are getting paid to fill out death certificates. Um, and that honestly is not the truth. Um, I have never been paid to fill out a death certificate for any reason. Um, where, and where does that come from? Where does that rumor come from? Do you think? So there, so, so the, there was a stimulus package that was, um, that was passed earlier this year, um, that gave hospitals, I want to say 
an extra 30% um, for taking care of coronavirus patients. And, and it, it doesn't pay them any extra if the patients actually die, um, but, but it gives them a little extra. And the idea with that was just that it would make up for loss of you know, surgeries and other routine kinds of things that they had to cancel uh, because they were mm. taking care of these patients. Mm. Um, and so somehow that turned into the hospitals are making a killing um, taking care of these patients. And so they're just really trying to jack up the numbers. Um, yeah. yeah. So th- there's, there's a, there's several questions there that would be interesting to go down. Um, but maybe we'll put hospitals and even like the economic state of a lot of hospitals kind of on the table for now um, mm-hmm. and just come back to more perhaps relevant to, to most of my listeners um, there, a lot of people have the impression that if we would all just, so this, you know, our, there's quite a few people in our church that got COVID mm-hmm. and it wasn't that serious for us, the ones that got it. Um, I, my, I myself got it. And other than the fact that I've not had a flu shot in years, like, I don't know if it's been 12, 15 years and I've not gotten the flu and now I get COVID. So like, obviously it's, it must be out there and a little more contagious mm-hmm. than, than the flu. Um, it, it wasn't super bad. Like the, the whole taste and smell thing was really weird. <laughs> and I don't know why a, a virus does that. So then there's this perspective that like, oh, we should just all get it. And then we'll have herd immunity and we can function like normal within our community. Is that, is that a wise approach? Is that a foolish approach? What what do you have to say about, especially the concept of herd humanity? I know in your last update, you, you talked about how that, uh, forget how you worded it, might not, might not be as possible as we think or something along that line. Well, herd immunity is a really hard concept without a vaccine. So, mm-hmm. you know, if we've had, you know, 200, 20,000 deaths in this country from coronavirus so far in about 10% of the population has gotten it. You can imagine it, it could be pretty bad before we would get to 60, 70% of the people being immune. The young people would be okay. So if you're under 40, if you don't have medical problems, you're probably going to be fine. Um, mm. that, that's what I was going to say. The ones in our community that got it, like we're, we're relatively healthy people. Right. Yeah. So, and, and so, you know, that, that to me is a challenge though, because we, we don't, the hardest thing with coronavirus is we don't always have a way of predicting who's going to get really sick. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes hear people say things, well, they, they, you know, they'll say, you know, I'd rather die than wear a mask or I'd rather die than social distance. You know, I need to see my family. And, and, and I think some of that stuff is reasonable. Um, but at the same time, they don't really think in their head, you know, I'm going to die if I don't do this thing. Mm. Um, and then, you know, when they get really sick, it's not like they stay, well, I said I was willing to die for this, so I'm going to stay at home. No, they go into the hospital and they end up on a ventilator for three weeks. And, you know, and, mm. you know, and sometimes they get really, really sick. Um, and, and that to me is a challenge. You know, if, if coronavirus just killed you immediately and you were just dead and, you know, and your family mourned you, but, you know, you were gone and it's like, but what ends up happening is people get really, really sick and they, and they end up in an ICU, um, you know, on high flow oxygen or even a ventilator. And then 18 days later, they come off and then they're really weak and then they have to do rehab to get back to where they were at. And, and mm. it really takes a toll and families mm. sort of hang in the balance during that whole time. And that to me is a, is a really emotionally draining situation for families I've seen go through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so if there was, if there was a way to protect older people, and and only have people who would be, you know, who would do fine with it, get it. 
that would be, you know, probably okay. But it seems as though it's impossible to protect older people and have uh, younger people get it. it. It's just somehow that balance isn't there. Most older yeah. people receive care from younger people. And how yeah. do you work? That? Yeah. So you, you mentioned a couple of things that would be interesting to discuss the whole vaccine conversation as well. But maybe first, Will, what's the deal about masks? Like, are, are masks helpful? I know, I know you have talked about how masks work. I personally think masks work because it was, like here in California, we, we are anywhere we go, basically, we have to wear a mask if, if we're going to be indoors interacting with, with other people. Um, and then when, like, I, I went in to Indiana and masking wasn't a, a thing there. And it was after that, that I got COVID. <laughs> and so, and, and that's similar to a lot of us out here um, after being around communities where masking wasn't required. And so I, you know, that's purely anecdotal, but I have to wonder if, you know, was it the thing of not being masked? What's your perspective on that? How, how is masks, are masks us being manipulated, forced to not show our expressions to each other? Or is it actually a, a key to making life possible to return to normal for older people, for people more susceptible to COVID? Yeah, so mas the idea with masking is that COVID is born in little tiny water droplets. Um, some of them, so, so the CDC actually divides um, these into water droplets and aerosols. Aerosols are smaller than water droplets. But either way, if you're wearing a mask and you, and you cough or say something really loudly and there's water droplets that come out, your mask is going to catch those and they don't hang in the air. And so you, you know, let's say that you're in the process of developing COVID, but you don't have a fever, but you still got a little bit of virus in your airway. You can shed that virus and people around you could breathe it in. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's probably not as big a deal in, um, in situations where you're just passing through. So, you know, you're not walking through Walmart and you just suddenly inhale a cloud of virus and, you know, oh, I just got COVID that way. But it's more that you're in a sit down place where you're sitting for a little bit, you know, at least 10 to 15 minutes. And there's other people doing the same thing and they're talking and chatting. And one of them has low symptom or asymptomatic coronavirus. And so the idea is if you have a mask on, you don't shed the virus to the people around you. It may reduce somewhat as well the, the people who are wearing it that they don't breathe in as much coronavirus, uh, which is probably helpful. Like you don't get as sick if you catch coronavirus if you're wearing a mask, but that's not as effective. I, I'd say what, you know, what you're wearing a mask for is to keep from giving it to somebody else. And if everybody around you is also wearing a mask, you're probably pretty safe. Um, mm -hmm. Just because it cut, it's not, it's not like it totally eliminates the possibility of getting it, but it just cuts down the, as, the right. number of droplets that'll get through. So, I mean, I, I can tell you, you know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I had a patient who came into my office for a routine checkup. And we're not typically seeing COVID patients in our office at this point. We may down the road here. But um, um, but he had a mask on, I had a mask on, and I spent 20 minutes with him. Next day, he spiked 103 fever. You know, so clearly he was developing coronavirus, um, tested positive for it. I did not get it. Um, and that to me is kind of a little bit of an anecdotal thing where I say, okay, you know, I clearly was exposed to something there. Um, uh, and the combination of his mask and my mask was able to, to prevent that from starting. And I'm glad I didn't really want COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what do you, how do you feel about well, why it was interesting that you pointed out the the difference between walking through it and sitting in it. Why do all the stores 
at least here in California, require, and I'm assuming most major cities, at least, if not a lot of the states by now, um, require masks to go in them. If, if just because that's a like the whole virus could be hovering in the building with so many people. I, I'm guessing it's uh, it's for their employees primarily. Oh, so the employees are spending considerable time in there. You are walking yeah. through an aisle. They are standing there stalking it. And if, you know, and, and for the employees, it's probably a more of a risky situation. I think about that, you know, in restaurants too, you know, I, I'm sure there's mm. uh, waiters and waitresses who, who catch COVID um, just because there's someone who um, passes through their restaurant and, you know, obviously you don't wear a, a, um, a mask while you're eating. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're suggesting that we have to think a lot more about the different people affected by this, not just whether I'm going to get it when I go out. Absolutely. I, yeah. As I was sort of thinking about it, because um, you had sent me some questions uh, today, and and there's there are different people that I think um, – are affected more harshly by coronavirus. Um, and to me, it's people with um, some type of health condition, and that would be you know, older people, um, but also people maybe who have um, uh, diabetes or high blood pressure, um, some kind of chronic lung disease. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second group are people who might have to take off considerable periods of time off of work if they catch coronavirus. So if I catch coronavirus, I have to take a minimum of about 10 days unpaid out of my office. And that's difficult for my office. It's not good for me. And, and so, you know, whereas, you know, somebody who um, many, many plain folks are able to, to go back to work more rapidly if they're working outside or, you know, working, from home or, or different things like that. And so we have to think about that as well. It could be a very hard, um, big hardship on a family if, um, if somebody in their family is not able to, um, to bring home a paycheck for a, a week or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are so many questions that would be interesting to, to talk about, but I know we're, we're running up on an hour here soon. And so maybe we'll move along. Um, just to touch on the vaccines a little bit, what what's kind of your perspective on vaccine, on the COVID vaccine? Is is the coronavirus vaccine one you would take, have your kids take? Because um, I know a lot of the, some of the stuff that I've followed on it is just how most vaccines take several years to develop. And this one's kind of being rushed through. And yet then I also know... Um, like my sister was talking about, I think s some countries in Europe and maybe Asia are using a vaccine already, but the U.S. hasn't quite seen the results they want first. And so I know it, there's a rigorous process of finding a good vaccine. What are your thoughts on it? What are yeah? So Russia and China have actually started vaccinating their their folks with a beta vaccine. They just, they haven't tested it um, a whole lot, but they said, well, it's a vaccine and it doesn't seem to kill people. And so we're going to give it to people. Um, and we're trying to split the difference. So what, um, what the U S government has done is they have gone to several vaccine makers and said, we will buy millions of doses of your vaccine before you finish testing with it, go ahead and make them. And we will buy them even if it doesn't work. And it's a little bit of a gamble, but typically what happens is a vaccine goes through um, phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And then it gets FDA approval, and then they make millions of doses of vaccine. So right now, there are four or five different vaccine makers that are in the process of doing phase three trials. And so each one of those vaccines is going to be tested on between 30 and 60,000 people. And then we're going to have some information. How well does it seem to work? Um, are there major side effects? Are there people who shouldn't get it? Are there people who, who will benefit a lot from getting it? And, and then we can make a better decision. Right now, it's really hard to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that something you would... Um, sorry, I was just... 
deciding if I want to go down the vaccine route or not. But um, so, what's so your view I'm on not, vaccines? Yeah. So I am not opposed to vaccines. I I typically get a flu shot. I tip. I mean, I have to for my work anyway. But um, yeah. But but I I typically um, am somebody who gets vaccines and who thinks that they are beneficial. Um, so mm. you know the fact that. So, and, and, you know, that said, you know, some things like influenza vaccine is not a, it's not a great vaccine. So, you know, mm-hmm. in an individual season, it may be 30% effective. It could be as much as 60% effective, but it's never a hundred percent effective. And, you know, we don't know with COVID, maybe it's not going to be that effective, um, mm-hmm. you know, but maybe it will be, you know, and but I, I would say, you know, we need some data before we can say it's good or bad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we'll let vaccines go there. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing your perspective Mm -hmm. on that. Um, just to kind of go into conspiracy theories a little bit and, and maybe more than just conspiracy theories, the suspicion of the medical field, the uh, science, particularly you are an Anabaptist. You're part of, I'm not sure if I said this at the beginning, you're part of Bethel Mennonite. Is that? Bethel Mennonite church in Gladys, Virginia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So particularly in our conservative Anabaptist circles, there seems to be, I don't know. I know of more nurses and even doctors in our churches than at least what I was aware of, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So maybe mm-hmm. some stuff is changing, but there seems to be suspicion of the medical world, the medical field. And why is that? Or what, what are some of your thoughts on that? And, and yeah, what, what, what would you have to say? Why, why are we prone to conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and all that? I, I don't know for sure. Um, I, I think some of it is just that COVID has been politicized more than a lot of other illnesses. Mm. Um, and, you know, typically, you know, people always bring up influenza at the same time as they, as they mentioned COVID and influenza isn't typically politicized. Uh, even when we have a bad influenza season, nobody says, well, you know, that's somebody's fault or, you know, yeah. Whatever. And so I think that making it political has really harmed the messaging that goes out around it. Yeah. And is that because of its election year, do you think, or, or why, why has it been so politicized? I, I don't really know. I, yeah. I think a lot of people think the president should have been clearer on messaging. Um, although mm. My perspective is that most enforcement of even, like, let's say mask mandates happens on a local level. And so, Mm. you know, one area of the country is different from another area. And I I don't always know how much the president has to do with some of these things. But Mm. regardless, Mm. I I think some people say he did a good job and some people not so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then as a result, then there's all sorts of things that have flown up around it and to minimize it or to say, you know, doctors aren't using this effective treatment or whatever it is. What are, yeah. What, so, I mean, there's the whole, um, I don't, I have no clue how to pronounce those, those um, treatments, those medicines like hydroxychloroquine and mm-hmm. uh, REMS. Remdesivir. Rendezivir. As I understand it, those are made by two competing pharmaceutical companies. No. So, so okay. hydroxychlor- hydroxychloroquine is actually a um, it's an anti malaria medication um, that's also used for autoimmune diseases um, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, um, and it's um, it's a pretty safe medicine. Long term, if you take hydroxychloroquine, you need to get your eyes checked because it can cause um, some retinal issues. But but short term, it's probably a safe enough medicine. I think the challenge is that there have been some big randomized clinical trials that um, that have looked at hydroxychloroquine 
um, in the hospital setting, and then also as trying to use it as a preventative. And, and those were all negative. Mm. There have been some anecdotal things where people said, well, I, did a, I treated a whole bunch of patients with it, and they all got better. You know, 300, I treated a yeah. thousand patients with it and they all got better. Not a single one of them even got into the hospital. And um, <laughs> so anyway, I most yeah. doctors, when they look at it, they would say, well, you know, a double blinded randomized trial is better than anecdotal evidence. Uh, so I, I always tell people experience is a thing that lets me make the same mistakes with a lot more confidence. And yeah. Um, and so if I've always treated X um, situation with Y medicine and most of the people have made it, then I'm just going to keep using Y medicine, even if Y medicine actually doesn't help or maybe harm slightly. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. What, just to make sure I caught what you were saying, are you saying hydroxychloroquine is better before you get the virus? No, I it's, it's not clear that hydroxychloroquine does a whole lot for people with COVID. Okay, okay. So yeah. hydroxychloroquine is a generic medicine. So it's not made... So remdesivir is something that is, um, is an experimental medicine, and it's very expensive. And it's only used for people who are really sick in the ICU. Um, hmm. So the idea with the hydroxychloroquine was you take this hydroxychloroquine uh, with an antibody called Zithromax, and with zinc, and it's just going to wipe the virus out, and you'll get better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and so, um, but but in the studies anyway, it hasn't panned out that way. But yeah. there are a number of doctors who said, well, they've used it lots and lots, mm -hmm. and it's it's worked wonderfully. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, this is just anecdotal as well. But my sister's hospital was using early very early on was using hydroxychloroquine and the like there's a combination of medicines you're, you use with it mm -hmm. and they just weren't really seeing any results and they switched to remdesivir and they saw a lot more positive results and so it just yeah kind of led to so i mean what i what, what i tell people is if if you're diagnosed with covid and you and you're not sick enough that you need to be in the hospital you probably should get a pulse ox checker and monitor your heart rate and your in your oxygen level um, and as long as those are staying up you don't need to go into the hospital um, you know you can get one of those for 15 dollars probably you know at a pharmacy what did you say you that was? a pulse oximeter it's just something you put on your finger and it tells you your oxygen level and your pulse rate okay um, so, and then I, I do suggest that people go ahead and take some zinc and some vitamin D if they're, if they are, um, diagnosed with that, try to control their fever with, um, uh, you know, with whatever they need to. Um, and then if, if people are sick enough to end up in the hospital, then we tend to give them steroids, which, um, you know, there's a number of steroids, but, um, but dexamethasone was the one that was initially tested. Um, remdesivir is used for sicker people as well. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are basically synthetic antibodies against coronavirus that are experimental right now. Um, but those are probably going to be coming out soon. And maybe okay. those will be helpful. Doc, um, Donald Trump got those when he was in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. So... Um the, I guess kind of part of what I was trying to get at is there like, again, if you kind of look on social media, it's, it, you haven't seen it recently, but earlier in the summer, July, August, maybe a little bit more, um, a lot of suspicion over, you know, uh, I don't know if it's the CDC or Dr. Fauci or who was, was not recommending hydroxychloroquine as opposed to remdesivir and stuff and yeah i'm just curious like why from your perspective what i guess what should we remember as lay people as christians um why is there so much suspicion of the medical experts uh 
re- reading some kind of agenda, secret agenda being pushed behind or whatever. What do you have any thoughts on that? So I, I think a lot of people don't have an understanding of the normal testing process. And so yeah. if, you, if you have a new medicine um, and you say, I think this medicine is going to work for coronavirus. And I tried it on 20 different people and it worked beautifully. That's a start. But then you have to go from there. And what you need to do is you need to take um, 200 sick people and divide them up. And you give 100 of them standard of care treatment, whatever that is. And you give 100 of them your medicine and you compare them and you say, okay, did this medicine actually make a difference? Um, Because what you were saying earlier is correct. Most people with COVID actually do well. And if I have young, healthy people in my practice and I give them uh, hydroxychloroquine and they all get better, it wasn't the hydroxychloroquine that made them better. It was the fact they were young and healthy. So if you look at Africa, their their death rate is really low. Um, And the reason why is because their their median age in a lot of those countries is 18, 19 years old. And those people, they don't have many elderly people to um, to catch COVID and then to and then to die from it. And so, you know, even if they have a bunch of people with COVID, uh, the death rate in people who are less than 20 is very low. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So what I guess in, in light of that um, and just to kind of wrap up our time here, what would you like leaders to know, whether that's our church leaders or organizational leaders, that it it seems – so if we have a business and the state has regulations, it seems we're a little more quick. Obviously I'm not in Virginia or Pennsylvania or somewhere I'm, I'm here in California. It seems we're quicker to accept the regulations to keep our business going. But then when there's regulations asked of churches, it feels like infringement on religious Liberty rights and so forth. And, what would you like maybe specifically our church leaders to hear as a, as a medical doctor, but even just leaders in general who are needing to make decisions. And obviously it, it church is unique in that we don't, the head of the church is obviously not the state and, mm-hmm. and we follow Christ regardless of what we're being required to do or forced to do or whatever. But, in a pandemic like this, yeah, I guess what, what are some of your thoughts and, and maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll let you start with that. And then. I, I don't honestly know the answer. As I was thinking about, as I was thinking just about the pandemic, I just thought, you know, humans are better at dealing with tornadoes and hurricanes. And mm-hmm. It is, it is easy in a sense to deal with something that happens quickly and is done, even if it's a terrible thing. You know, a tsunami hits and there is all sorts of devastation, but then it's done and you can, you know, mop things up. And something that just keeps on going wears us down. And so mm-hmm. a lot of people were willing to wear masks in the beginning, but now they just feel like, what's the point, you know, and, you know, what's the end of this and how do, you know, how do we keep on going? And, you know, they just want to go back to church as normal. And, and so I don't know how that happens, but I do think it is important that we protect um, all groups within the church, not just, um, not just those who are young and healthy and would be okay Mm. with it. And it is really sad to me if there are groups of people who don't feel comfortable going to church because they don't feel safe. Mm. And I think mm. if there's something that I personally can do that will make people feel safer, that they would be able to attend, then I want to be able to do that. And, and I think being honest with people and saying, you know, this is not something that any of us enjoy doing, but, you know, we're going to do the loving thing for our brothers and sisters uh, is, yeah. is right. And then, and then kind of secondly, you know, I do think 
if the state asks us to do certain things, um, we should try to do that. Um, at the same time, I mean, it is important that churches continue to meet. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that they have to be meeting indoors if the weather's okay, you know, maybe outdoors is safer, uh, you know, whether or not you uh, wear masks during your service, you know, I mean, I do, <laughs> I, yeah. I can't say everybody at my church does, but, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, I feel like it's a, it's something I can do to help out. Yeah. You know, and obviously if you're sick, probably don't go to church at that point, you know, yeah. there's things to listen or view from home probably. Yeah. Yeah. As a Christian who works as a doctor, how does that influence your take on the science coming in about COVID and how you look at the future in regards to it? I, I was just thinking about this last night. Um, you know, yeah, there's so many different voices out there, even within the Christian world. But then if you think, uh, and this kind of dovetails on our previous conversation a little bit about the suspicion of the medical world. Um, obviously those who deny God, their God has become science. Like what you can test and see and know is true for sure. Um, and, and so there's going to be some conclusions and ideas worldview that, you know, obviously they don't have the area of faith, at least in a, in a, in a higher power that can preserve and keep us. Um, how does it shape you as a Christian looking at the science, looking at the pandemic and looking at the future? Like what, what is your hope? I think uh, we, we have a lot of people dying that would not have had to die in 2020 because of COVID-19. And then we also have a lot of people that are really depressed and discouraged, maybe because they're not able to see people, but then also beca because of the anxiety of this pandemic that, you know, what's the end to it? And then there's also the anxiety of just all the conflict and controversy. And, and so it just looks really dark and bleak. If, whether you're looking at the virus or at the the new normal some people talk about what is as a medical as a christian who's a medical doctor where do you kind of keep your focus how do you process all of this looking looking at the future i think that there's certain words that sort of come to me you know first of all you know honesty so honesty about the bigness of the problem. It is a big problem. Honesty about the smallness of myself. I'm not capable to take care of this and I am not capable of understanding everything that's behind it. Um, we don't know everything about coronavirus and the people who say that they do and they've solved it. I don't honestly believe them totally. Um, so, uh, you know, second thing would be love. So thinking about how, I can love my patients where they're at with the things that they're facing, the stresses with them. And sometimes that, you know, sometimes I pray with them. Sometimes, you know, I just spend time talking to them about, you know, the discouragements that they're facing, the, the isolation they're feeling and different things like that. Um, because those are all really important things uh, in their lives. Um, and it's not because I can bill for it, but it's because it's important. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and then I, I think courage. So, you know, there is a, there is a tendency to be afraid to think about, um, I don't know, when I was in medical school, coming up to a big test, you, you, you have a little bit of nervousness, anxiety, thinking about, do I have the knowledge? Am I ready to face this thing that's coming up? And, and there has been some of that for me personally, not so much that I'm afraid of getting COVID, but just, you know, what if there is more um, sickness than what our little office can handle, what our community can handle? Um, that's, that's a scary thing to think about and to realize that even though I'm not enough for every situation God is and that he will give the strength for the day, um, but he doesn't give us the strength ahead of time. 
Um, and that's, those to me are kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So honesty, acknowledging how big the problem is, how little we are love, loving people, walking with them, whatever situation they're facing. And like, there's so many tragedies happening at one time this year. Like there's people getting sick. There's people out of work, economic struggles, depression struggles. Yeah. Loving each other in the midst of it all. And then courage and walk, not living in fear, but walking in the courage of God that he is with us. He's bigger than all of this. Those are good. Thank you, John, for taking the time. I know this is your off day. And so thank you for giving a little bit of it here to do this interview. I was glad to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, people are welcome to follow you and check up your weekly updates. You, you put them out Friday or Saturday, I think every week. Yeah. I usually try to get it, um, write something somewhere around Thursday evening, Friday morning. And, um, mm. Um, yeah, they're, it's just trying to summarize a little bit of what the last week's news were. And, and then usually I try to have something that's more of a, um, yeah, maybe a devotional thought that I've been thinking about in the last few days, um, that, um, you yeah, maybe has impressed me. Yeah. Yeah. You also have a blog that I don't know. Do you write a whole lot on it? Um, I used to write a whole lot on it, and then I, then I, I don't know, something about life um, filled up my time. So I, yeah, uh, I have written um, more sporadically in the last six months. Before that, I was writing every week on my blog. Okay, but it's called Doctor John's Jottings. So, uh, yeah, Doctor John's Jottings, uh, John Waldron sixty five dot blogspot dot com. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, I have it as a safe. Thing, so I can go directly to it but yeah yeah exactly it. one of your recent ones was the Christian and conspiracies and that I, I definitely recommend people checking that out uh, that's uh, the concept of conspiracy theories and why we're so drawn to conspiracy theories has been something I've been pondering all summer um, and I, I just thought you had some really good thoughts on it as you were kind of talking about it with your son I think a little bit mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, 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 and one of the things that I've I've been thinking about since I wrote that is that it doesn't really matter if the conspiracies are right or wrong. Maybe the biggest problem with conspiracies is that these distract us from our mission as Christians. Yeah, and, and that that breaks my heart a little bit. If we're so focused on figuring out who's to blame for something that we can't help heal those who are hurting. Yeah. yeah. And I, I forget if you said this in your article or not, but like the thing about conspiracies is y you can't really know if they're right or wrong. Like they're kind of ambiguous and, and you can't quite prove them. And so I, I totally agree. It, it tends to distract us from our mission. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for coming on. And maybe in six months, we'll have some something new about COVID to address and talk about. Okay. Well, I'd be glad to do it, Asher.